I learned in this letter that Don Pedro of Aragon comes this night to Messina. He is very near by this. He was not three leagues off when I last left him. Have many gentlemen been lost in this action? But few of any sort, and none of name. A victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. I have found in this letter that Don Pedro hath bestowed much honor on a young Florentine called Claudio. Much deserved on his part, and equally remembered by Don Pedro, that bore himself beyond the promise of the stage, doing the figure of a lamb that speaks of a lion. Captain, have indeed had a better expectation than you must expect of me to tell you how. He hath an uncle here, and Messina will be very much glad of it. I have already delivered him letters, and there appears a great joy in him. Even so much that joy cannot show itself modest without a bad bitterness. Did he break out into tears? In great measure. A kind overflow of kindness. There are no faces truer than those that are so washed. How much better it is to weep at joy than to joy at weeping. I pray you, is Signor Montanto returned from the wars or no? I know none of that, my lady. There was none the army of any sort. Who is he that you ask me? My cousin named Signor Benedict of Padua. <laughs> Signor Benedict, too much, but he'll meet with you, I doubt it not. He hath done it seriously. In these wars, you had musty victual, and he hath hoped to eat it. He is a very valiant trencherman. He hath an excellent stomach. And a good soldier too, lady. And a good soldier to a lady. But what is he to a lord? <laughs> a lord to a lord, a man to a man. Stop with all horrible virtues. It is so indeed. He is no less. Man! <laughs> but for the stuffing, well, we are all mortal. You are too harsh, niece. There is a sort of merry war between Signor Benedict and her. They never meet, but there is always a skirmish of wit. Alas, he gets nothing by that. In our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off, and now is the whole man governed with one. So that if he have wit enough to keep himself warm, let him bear it for a difference between himself and his horse. For it is all the wealth that he hath left to be known a reasonable creature. Who is his companion now? He hath every month a new sworn brother. Is it possible? Very easily possible. He wears his faith but as the fashion of his hat. It ever changes with the next world. I see, lady. This gentleman is not in your books. No! Were, I would burn my study. <laughs> but I pray you, who is his companion? Is there no young swearer now that will make a voyage with him to the devil? He is most in the company of the right noble, Claudio. Oh, Lord! He will hang upon him like a disease. He is sooner caught than the pestilence, and the taper ones presently mashed. God help the noble Claudio. If he hath caught the Benedict, it will cost You will never run mad, niece. No, not till a hot January. <laughs> Benedict, courtesy itself must convert to disdain if you come in her presence. 
then courtesy is a turncoat. But it is certain I am loved of all ladies, only you accepted. And I would I could find in my heart that I have not a hard heart, for truly I love none. A dear happiness to women! <laughs> they else would have been troubled with a pernicious suitor. But I thank God and my cold blood that I am of your humor for that. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. God keep your ladyship still in that humor, so some gentleman or other shall take a predestined scratch face. Scratching could not make it worse and twere such a face as yours were. Oh, well, you are a rare parent, teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I would my horse had the speed of your tongue and so good a continuer. But keep your way in God's name, for I have done. You always end with a jade's trick. I know you will go. That is the sum of all, Leonardo. Senor Claudio and Senor Benedict. My dear friend Leonardo hath invited you all. And I tell him we shall stay here at the least a month. And he heartily prays some occasion may detain us longer. I dare swear he is no hypocrite, but praise from his heart. If you swear, my lord, you shall not be forsworn. Let me bid you welcome as well, my lord. Being reconciled with the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. <laughs> thank you. I, I don't have many words, but thank you. <laughs> Please, it your grace, lead on. <laughs> Baldrick, 
All but a show part. I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any, so I will do myself the right to trust none. And the finest, for the which I may go the finer, I shall live a bachelor. I shall see thee ere I die, look pale with love. With hunger, with sickness, or with anger, my lord, not with love. Proof that ever I lose more blood with love than I can get again with drinking, pick out mine eyes with a ballad maker's pen, and hang me at the door of a brothel house with a sign of blind cubit. Well, if ever thou dost fall from this faith, thou wilt prove a notable argument. Prove that ever I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat, and shoot at me. <laughs> well, as time shall try, in time the savage bull doth bear the yoke. A savage bull may prove that ever sensible Benedict bear it. Pluck off the bull's horns, and set them in my forehead. And let them be vilely painted. And in such great letters as they signify, Here is good horse to hire, let it be written under my sign, Here you may see Benedict, the married man. <laughs> if this should ever happen, thou wouldst be a born man. Nay, if Cupid have not spent all this quiver and rest, thou wilt quake for this shortly. Well, I'll look for an earthquake too, then. Well, you will temporize with the others. In the meantime, good Signor Benedict, prepare to be an others. Command me to him, and tell him I will not fail him at support, for indeed he hath made great preparation. I have almost matter enough of me for such an embassage, and so I leave you. I <laughs> please your highness now may do me good. My love is thine to teach, teach it but how, and thou shalt see how apt it is to learn any hard lesson that may do thee good. Hath Leonardo a son, my lord? No, no child but hero. She's his only heir. Dost thou affect her, Claudio? Oh, my lord. When you went onward on this ended action, I looked upon her with a soldier's eye. That life but had a rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. But now I'm returned and these thoughts of wars have left these places vacant. And in their rooms come thronging soft and delicate desires, all prompting me to how fair young hero is, saying I loved her ere I went to wars. Thou wilt be like a lover presently, and tire the hero with a book of words. If thou dost not fair, he will cherish it, and I will break with her and with her father, and thou shalt have her. Was not to this end that thou begast it with so fine a story? How sweetly you do administer the love that knows love's grief by its inflection, but if my liking makes you sudden seem, I, I would have solved it with longer trees. What need the bridge much broader than the flood? The fairest grant is a necessity. Look what would so misfit. This once thou lovest, and I will fit thee with the remedy. I know thee shall have reveling to them. I will assume thy part in some disguise, and tell fair hero, I am Claudio. And in her bosom I'll unclasp my heart, and take her here in prisoner with the force and strong encounter of my amorous tale. Then after, to her father will I bring, and the conclusion is, she shall be thine. In practice, let us put it presently. Brother, where is my nephew, your son? Hath he provided this music? He is very busy about it, but... Brother, I can tell you strange news that you cannot track them. Is it good? As the event stamps them. But they have a good cover. They show well outward. The prince and Count Claudio, talking here upon the shore, were thus overheard. The prince was coming to Claudio that he loved my niece, your daughter, and meant to acknowledge it this night in advance. And if he found her accordant, he meant to take the present time by the top and instantly break with you up. Art thou sure? Oh, sure. Question him yourself. No, no. We will hold it a dream until it appeared itself with all. In the meantime, go you and acquaint her of it so that she may be better prepared if her adventure this be true. Go you and tell her. <laughs> Good brother, have a care in this busy time!
Lord, why are you thus out of measure sad? There is no measure in the occasion that pleads, and therefore the sadness is without limit. You should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing brings it? Is not a present remedy at least a patient sufferance? I wonder that thou, being as thou sayest thou art, born under Saturn, goes about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jests, eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure, sleep when I am drowsy and tend to no man's business, laugh when I am merry and plot no man in his humor. Get 
her goodwill. Niece, thou wilt never get thee a husband if thy be so shrewd of thy tongue. In faith, she's too cursed. Too cursed is more than cursed. I shall lessen God sending that way, for it is said God sends a cursed cow short horns. But to a cow too cursed, he sends none. So by being too cursed, God shall send you no horns? Just. If he send me no husband for the which blessing, I am at him upon my knees every morning and evening. Lord, I could not endure a husband with a beard on his face. I'd rather lie in a woman. You may lie on a husband with no beard. What should I do with him? Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? <laughs> he that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me, and he that is less than a man, I am not for him. <laughs> well, niece, I trust you will be ruled by your father. Yes, faith, it is my cousin's duty to make courtesy and say, Father, as it please you. But yet, for all that, let him be a handsome fellow, or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as he please me. <laughs> Daughter, that I do hope someday to see you fitted with a husband. Not till God make man of some other metal than earth. Would he not breathe a woman to be overmastered by a piece of valiant <coughs> dust to make an account of her life to a clod of wayward marl? No, uncle, all none. Adam's sons are my brethren, and truly I hold it a sin to match my kindred. Daughter, you will remember those things I told you of. If the prince do solicit you in that kind, you know your answer. The fault will be in the music, cousin, if you be not moving good time. If the prince be too important, tell him there's measure and everything, and so death out the answer. For hear me, hero, wooing, wedding, and repenting are as a swash jig, a measure, and a syncopate. The first suit is hot and hasty, like a swash jig, and full as fantastical, the wedding, mannerly modest as a measure, full of state and ancientry. And then comes repentance, and with his bad life falls into the syncopate faster and faster till he sink into his grave. Careful, niece, thou apprehend passing shrewdly. I have a good eye, uncle. I can see a church by daylight. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
puzzled. Nor will you tell me who you are? Not now. That I was disdainful, and that I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales? Well, this was Signor Benedict who said so. Who? What's he? I'm sure you know him well enough. I pray you, why not I believe me? Did he never make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Why, he's the prince's jester. A very dull fool, only his gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but libertines delight in him. And the competition is not in his wit, but in his villainy. For he both pleases men and angers them, and then they laugh at him, and then they beat him. I'm sure he's in the fleet. I would he have wanted him. When I know the gentleman, I will then tell him what you say. <laughs> He'll but break a comparison or two on me, which peradventure not marked or not laughed at strikes him into melancholy. And then there's a partridge wing saved, for the fool will need no supper that night. <laughs> to the banquet! Overjoyed at finding a bird's nest, 
shows it his companion, and he steals it. Wilt thou make a trust a transgression? The transgression is in the stealer. Yet, it had not been this the rod had been made, and the garland too. For the garland he might have worn himself, and the rod he might have bestowed upon you, who, I take it, has stolen his bird nest. I will but teach them to sing and restore them to the owner. Their singing match your saying. By my faith, you say true. The Lady Beatrice hath a quarrel to you. The gentleman that danced with her told her she is much wronged by you. She abused me past the endurance of a block. An oak with but one green leaf on it would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. <laughs> she told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was the prince's jester, that I was duller than a great claw, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance that I stood like a man in the heart with a whole army shooting at me. Speaks poniards, and every word stabs. If her breath were as terrible as her terminations, there were no living near her. She would infect to the North Star. I would not marry her if she were endowed with all Adam had left him before he transgressed. Come, talk not of her. I went to God some scholar would conquer her, for certainly while she is here, a man may live as quiet in hell as in a sanctuary, and people sin upon purpose because they would go thither. Yea, all disquiet, horror, and perturbation follows her. Look, here she comes. Would your grace now have any hand to send me on to the world then? I will go now on a slice, and I'll give you to send me on to the antipodes. I will fetch you a toothpicker from the first in Asia, bring you the length of the of John's foot, pluck you a hair off a great chain here, do you any message to the ladies, rather than three words confidence with that hardly. <laughs> you have no such appointment for me? None. <laughs> but to desire your good company. Oh, 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 good sir, there's a dish I cannot love. I cannot endure my lady tongue. <laughs> come, lady, come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, my lord. He lent it me a while, and I gave him use for it. A double heart for a single one. Marry once before he wanted to me with false dust. <coughs> Therefore, your grace may well say, I have lost it. You have put it down, lady, you have put it down. So I would not he should do me, my lord, lest I prove the mother of fools. I brought him Claudio, whom you sent me to see. Why, how now, Count? Wherefore are you sad? Not sad, my lord. How then sick? Neither. The Count is neither sad nor sick, nor merry nor well, but Sybil count, Sybil as an orange, or something of that jealous complexion. In faith, lady, I think you place it to be true. Though I be sworn, if he be so, his conceit is false. Your Claudio, I have wooed in thy name, and fair hero is one. I have broke with her father, and his good will obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count. Take of me my daughter, and with her my fortunes. His grace hath made the match, and all grace say amen to it. Speak, Count, tis your cue. <laughs> Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I was but little happy if I could say how much. Lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give away myself to you and dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you may not, stop his mouth with a kiss and let him not speak neither. In faith, lady, I think you have, you have a merry heart. Yea, I think it more fool it keeps on the windy side of fair. My cousin tells him in his ear that she is in his heart. And so she doth, cousin. <laughs> Good Lord for alliance, thus goes everyone to the world but I. I may sit in a corner and cry, high ho for a husband. Lady Beatrice, I will get you one. I'd rather have one of your father's getting. Have your grace ne'er a brother like you? Your father got excellent husbands, if a maid could come by them. Will you have me, lady? No, my lord. Unless I might have another for working days. <laughs> your grace is too costly to wear every day. But I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth, 
offend no matter. Your silence most offends me, and to be merry best becomes you. For out of question, you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord, my mother cried, but then there was a star danced, and under that I was born. Cousins, God give you joy. Niece, you will look to those things I told you of. I cry you mercy, uncle, by your grace's I, my troth, a pleasant-spirited lady. There is little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. She is never sad, not even when she sleeps. For I have oft heard my daughter say she hath dreamt of unhappiness and waked herself from laughing. She cannot endure to hear tell of a husband. Oh, by no means. She mocks all her wooers out of suit. She were an excellent wife of Benedict. My lord, were they but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. <laughs> Call me Claudio, I mean you to go to church. Tomorrow, my lord. Time goes on crutches until love has all its right. Not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence but a seven night and far too brief a time to have all questions answer my mind. Come, you shake my head at so long of breathing. But I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go down the files. I will in the terror undertake one of Hercules' labors which is to bring Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection. The one <laughs> I would fain have it a match, and doubt not but to fashion it, if you three will but minister such assistance as I shall give you direction. I am for you, my lord, though it cost me ten nights watching. And I, my lord. And you too, gentle hero. I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is of the unhopefulest husband that I know. <laughs> Thus far can I praise him. He is of a noble strain, of a proven valor, and conformed honesty. I will teach you how to humor your cousin that she fall in love with Benedict. And I, with your two helps, will so practice on Benedict that in despite his quick wit and queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, <laughs> Cupid is no longer an archer. <laughs> His glory shall be ours, for we are the only love gods. Hooray! Who is thus like to be cozened with the semblance of a maid? 
which you have discovered thus. Though scarce believers without trial, offer them instances which shall bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hear me call Margaret Hero. Hear Margaret term me Claudio, and bring them to see this the very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent, and there shall appear such seeming truth of Hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance, and all the preparation overthrown. Grow this to an adverse issue again, and I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the working this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. Be you confident in the accusation, and my cunning will not shame you. I will presently go learn their day of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I pray thee, get us up 
excellent music. For tomorrow night, we shall have it at the Lady Hero's chamber window. The best I can, my lord. Do so. Farewell. Come hither, Leonardo. What was it you told me of today? That your niece, Beatrice, was in love with Signor Benedict? <laughs> <laughs> No, nor I, but tis most wonderful that she should dote on Signor Benedict, whom she hath in all outward behavior only ever seemed to have borne. Is it possible? <laughs> Sits the wind in this corner? By my troth, my lord, I know not what to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection. Tis past the infinite of thought. Maybe she talked about counterfeit, if like enough. Oh, God! Counterfeit? Never came counterfeit of passion so close to the life of passion as she discovers it. Why? What affection of passion shows she? Bait the hook well, this fish will bite. What effects, my lord? You heard my daughter tell you of it. She did indeed. How, how, I pray you. <laughs> ah! You amaze me! Oh. I would have thought her spirit had been invincible against all assaults of affection. Especially against Benedict. I should think this a gull, but that the white bearded fellow speaks it. Maybe we cannot sure hide itself in such reverence. Yet think in the infection, hold it up. Had she made her affection known to Benedict? No, and she swears she never will. That's her torment. Tis so, so your daughter says, shall I, says she, that so often countered him with scorn, write to him that I love him? Yea, this she says, for she'll be up twenty times a night in her smock till she hath writ a sheet of paper. My daughter tells us all. Now you speak of a piece of paper. I remember a pretty jest your daughter spoke of. Ah, when she had writ and had been reading and had found Benedict and Beatrice between the sheet. That. <laughs> oh, she tore that letter into a thousand halfpence and railed at herself that she should be so immodest as to write to one whom she knew would flout her. I'll measure him, says she, by mine own spirit. For if he writ to me in that kind, I would flout him. Yea. Though I love him, I will. And the devil of her she falls, weeps, sobs, beats her heart, tears her hair, prays curses. Oh, sweet Benedict, God give me patience. <laughs> she talked indeed. My daughter says that she is afeard that ecstasy hath so much overborne her that she will do a desperate outrage to herself. This is all very true. <laughs> some other, if she would not discover it. To what end you would make but a sport of it and torment the poor lady worse? She's an excellent sweet lady, and out of all suspicion, she is virtuous and exceeding wise. In everything but in loving Benedict. <laughs> my lord, my lord, wisdom and blood combating in so tender a body, we have ten proofs to one that blood hath the victory. I am sorry for her, as I have just cause, being her uncle and her guardian. I would she had bestowed this dotage on me. <laughs> <laughs> I pray you, tell Benedict of it, and tell what he will say. Were it good, think you? But the hero thinks surely she will die, for she says she will die if you love her not, and she will die ere she makes her love known. And she will die if he will her rather than bait one's breath for her accustomed crossness. She doth well. If she should make tender of her love, tis possible he'll scorn it. For the man, as you know all, hath a contemptible spirit. He is a proper man. <laughs> he hath indeed a good outward happiness, before God and in my mind, very wise. He doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit. And I take him with a <laughs> Well, I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go see Benedict and tell him of her love? No, never, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She'll wear her heart out first. Well, we will hear further of it by your daughter. Let it cool the one. I love Benedict well, and I could wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy. So good a lady. <laughs> <laughs> will your grace walk? Dinner is ready. If ye do not dote upon this, I will never trust my expectation. Let there be the same net spread for her, and that must your daughter and her gentlewoman carry. 
The sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage and no such matter. Let us send her to call her to dinner. This can be no trick. <laughs> <laughs> the conference was sadly born. They had the truth of it from Hero. Seem to pity the lady. Seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that can hear their detractions and put them to mend. They say the lady is fair. Tis the truth, I can bear them witness. And virtuous. Tis so, I cannot reprove it. And wise. But for loving me. <laughs> By my troth, it is no great addition to her wit, nor no argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance that some odd quips and remnants of wit broken on me as I have railed so long against love. But doth not the appetite alter? The man loves the meat in his youth and he cannot endure in his age. Shall these quips and sentences and paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? No! <laughs> the world must be peopled. <laughs> I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. <laughs> Here comes Beatrice. By this day, she's a fair lady. <laughs> oh, I just buy some marks of love in her. <laughs> <laughs> Beatrice. 
disdain and scorn might sparkling in her eyes, misprising what they look on. And her wit values <laughs> so highly that to her all matter of seems weak. She cannot love, nor take no shape, nor project of affection. She is so self endeared Sure, I think so. And therefore, certainly, <laughs> not good. She knew his love, lest she'll make sport at it. Why, you speak truth. I never yet saw a man, how wise, how noble, young, how rarely featured. But she would spell him backward. If fair face, she would swear the gentleman should be her sister. If tall, <laughs> if, ragged, if low, an agate, very vilely cut. If speaking, why, a vein blown with all wind. If silent, why, a block moved with none. So turns she every man the wrong side out, and never gives to truth and virtue that which simpleness and merit purchaseth. Sure, sure, such harping is not commendable. No, not to be so odd and from all fashions, as Beatrice is cannot be commendable. But who dare tell her so? If I should speak, she would mock me into air. Oh, she would laugh me out of myself, press me to death with her wit. Therefore, let Benedict, like covered fire, Consume away in size, waste inwardly. It were a better death than die with mops, which is as bad as die with tickling. <laughs> Anyone can master 
a grief. But he that has it. <laughs> Yet say I, he is in love. There is no currents or fancy in him. If he not be in love with some woman, then there's no believing old signs. He brushes his hat over the morning. What should that be? <laughs> <laughs> Have any man seen him at the barber? No, but the barber man has been seen with him, and the old ornament on his face hath already stopped tennis balls. Oh, indeed, he looks younger than he did. Nay, he rubs himself with <laughs> cinnamon. And he's not allowed by that. That's as much as to say, the sweet youth's in love. The greatest note of it is his melancholy. And when was he born to wash his face? Yea, or to paint himself, for the which I hear what they say of him. Nay, but his jesting spirit, which is now crept into a loop string, and now governed by song. Indeed, that tells a heavy tale for him. Conclude, conclude, he is in love. Nay, but I know who loves him. That what I know too, I warrant one that knows him not. And in his ill condition, despite of all this, dies for him. She shall be buried with her face upward. Yet this is no charm for a toothache. <laughs> Hold, senor, walk aside with me a while. I've studied eight or nine wise words to speak to you, which these hobby horses must not hear. For my life to break with him about Beatrice. Tis so, here and Margaret have by this done their part with Beatrice, and the two bears will not bite one another next time they meet. My lord and brother, um, God save you. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, brother. If your leisure served, I would speak with you. In private? If it pleases you, yet Count Claudio may hear, for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter? Means your lordship to be married tomorrow. You know he does. I know not that when he knows what I know. There be any impediment that for you discover. You may think I love you not. Uh, let that be her hereafter, and better aim at me, for that I will now manifest. For my brother, who I think holds you well, and in dearness of heart hath hope to ensure your ensuing marriage. Surely soon he'll spend and labor ill bestow. Why, what's the matter? I come hither to tell her that circumstances be shortened, for she has been too long a talking of. The lady is disloyal. Who? Hero? Mm, even she, Leonardo's hero, your hero, every man's hero. Disloyal. <laughs> <laughs> the word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I, I could say she were worse. Think you of a worse title, and I will fit her to it. But wonder not till further warrant. Come up with me tonight, and see her chamber window entered, even on the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow when her father, it would better fit your honor for you to change your mind. Could this be so? I would not think it. If you dare not trust that you see, confess not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you. And when you have seen and heard more, then proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight as to why I should not marry her, then tomorrow at the congregation where we should wed, there will I shame her. And as I would for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no further till you have been my witnesses. Very coldly, but till midnight, and let the issue present itself. O oh, day of the lordly tarn, for oh, mischief strangely thwarted. O oh, plague, right well Well, <laughs> and so shall you say when you have seen the sequel.
suffer salvation, body and soul. Nay, that were a punishment too good for them if they should have any allegiance in them being chosen for the prince's watch. <laughs> well, give them their charge, Mr. Dogberry. First, who think you the most desire this man to be constant? Or holy advocate for Georgie Seacole, for they can be right. Come hither, neighbor Seacole. God hath blessed you with a good name. To be a well favored woman is the gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. Both which, Master Constable. You have, I knew it would be your answer. Well, for your favor, why, give God thanks and make no boast of it. And for your writing and reading, let that appear when there is no need of such vanity. You are thought here to be the most senseless and fit woman for the Constable of the Watch. Therefore, fare you the lantern. This is your charge. You shall comprehend all vagrant men. You would admit any man stand in the prince's name. How if he will not stand? Why then take no note of him, but let him go and presently call the rest of the watch together and thank God you are bid of a name. If he will not stand when he is bidden, he is none of the prince's subjects. True, and they are to meddle with none but the prince's subjects. You shall also make no noise in the streets, for for the watch to Babylon to talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. We would rather sleep than talk. We know what belongs to a watch. Why, you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only have a care that your bills be not stolen. Will you recall at all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk get them to bed? How if they will not? Well, then let them alone till they are sober. If they make you not, then the better answer you may say they are not the men you took them for. Well then, if you meet a thief, you may suspect him by virtue of your office to be no true man. And for such kind of men, the less you meddle or make with them, why, the more is for your honesty. If we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? Truly by your office you may, but I think they that touch pitch would be defiled. The most peaceful way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself what he is and steal out of your company. You have always been called a merciful woman, partner. <laughs> Truly, I would not name a dog by my will unless you are a man who hath any honesty in him. You hear a child crying the night who must call to the nurse and bid her still. <laughs> How if the nurse be asleep and will not hear us? Why then depart in peace and let the child wake her with crying? For the ear that will not hear her lamb when it lies will never answer a calf when it bleeds. This is very true. This is the end of the charge. You, constable, are to present the prince's own person. If you meet the prince in the night, you may stay. Nay, by our lady, that I think he cannot. Five shillings to one on with any man that knows the statutes, he may stay him. Mary, not without the prince be willing, for indeed the watch ought to offend no man, and it is an offense to stay a man against his will. By our lady, I think it be so. <laughs> <laughs> well, officers, good night. And there be any matter of late chances, call up me. Keep your fellow's counsels, and your own, and good night. Come, neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> well, masters, we have our charge. Let's sit here till two and then all to bed. <coughs> Yeah. 
or no? I have earned a Don job, a thousand ducats. Is it possible that any villainy could be so dear? <laughs> Thou shouldst rather ask if it were possible that any villainy could be so rich. For when rich villains have need of poor ones, poor ones may make what price they will. I wonder at it. Ah, that shows thou art unconfirmed. Thou knowest that the fashion of a doublet, or a hat, or a cloak, is nothing to a man. Yes, it is apparel. I mean the fashion. Just the fashion is the fashion. Ah, touch I may for say the fool's the fool. But seest thou not, I say, what is the form thief this fashion is? I know that the form. He's been a while thief just up and yet he goes up and down like a cow the Didst thou not hear somebody? <laughs> no, not twice the vein on the room. But seest thou not, I say, what is the form thief this fashion is? How gilly he turns about on the hot bloods between fourteen and five and thirty, sometimes fashioning them like Pharaoh's soldiers in the Ouija painting, sometimes like God those priests in the old church window, sometimes like the shade of Hercules in the smirched, worm eaten tapestries, where his codpiece seems as massy as his club. <laughs> All this I see, and I see that the fashion wears have more apparel than the man, but are not you guys self with the fashion that you have shifted out of that tail into pulling heat? <coughs> Oh, Not so neither, but know that I have tonight wooed Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to hero, by the name of hero. She leads me out of her mistress's chamber window, bid me a thousand times good night. Ah, I tell this tale vilely. I should first tell thee how the Prince Claudio and my master, planted, placed, and possessed by my master Don John, saw far off in the orchard this amiable encounter. And thought they, Margaret, was. Ah, two of them did, the prince and Claudio, but the devil my master knew she was Margaret. And partly by his oaths, which first possessed them, partly by the dark night, which did deceive them, but chiefly by my villainy, which did confirm his plan that Don John had made, away with Claudio, in rage, swore he would meet them, as he was appointed next morning at the temple, and there, before the whole congregation, Shame her with what he saw all her night, and sent her home again without a husband. <laughs> Is there any harm in the heavier for the husband? None, I think. And if you have a right husband and the 
the right work. Otherwise, it's his life and not heavy. Ask my lady of future's house. Here she comes. Good morrow, class. Good morrow, sweet dear. Why come now? Do you speak of the sick tune? The amount of all other tune, methinks. Class is a light of love. That goes without a burden. Do you sing it and all dance it? Do you light of love with your heels? Oh, illegitimate construction. I scorn that in my heels. It's almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you were ready. By my troth, I am exceeding ill. I know. <laughs> Wine, ere you go, fare you well. 
Go, good partner. Go get into the sexton. Bid him bring his pen and ink to the jail. We are not to examination these men. And you must do it wisely. We will spare her no wit, I warn you. Here's that she'll drive some of them to an uncom. Only get the learned writer to set down our excommunication and meet me at the jail. Mother, be brief, only to the plain form of marriage. You may recount their particular duties afterward. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady. No. <laughs> to be married to her. Good mother, you come to marry them. You come hither, lady, to be married to this cat. I do. If either of you know any inward impediment on what you should not be conjoined, I charge you on your souls to utter it. Know you any, hero? None, my lord. Know you any, count? I dare make his answer. None. Oh, what men dare do? What men may do? What men daily do not know what they do? How now, interjections? Why then some be as of laughing as I? Ah! Be. Stand thee by. Father, by your leave, do you with a free and unconstrained soul give me this maid, your daughter? As freely, son, as God did give her me. And what have I to give you in return that could counterpose such a rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble thankfulness. Well, there, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She is but the sign and semblance of her honor. See how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cutting sin cover itself with all. Comes not this blood as modest evidence to witness simple virtue? Would you not swear, all you that see her, that you are amazed by these exterior shows? But she is not. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married. Not to knit my soul to this approved wanton! My lord, if you in your own proof have made defeat of her, the very existence of her youth. I know what you would say. Had I known you would say that she did embrace you as a husband, and so extenuate the forehead sin. No, Leonardo, I never tempted her with words too large, but as a brother to a sister showed her bashful sincerity and comely love. And seemed I ever otherwise to you? Out on thy pretense, I will write against it! You sit to me as Diane in her orb, as chaste as the bud air to be blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus, or one of those pampered animals that rage in savage sensuality. Is my lord well, that he doth speak so wise? Sweet prince, why speak not you? What should I speak? I stand dishonored that I've gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. Are these things spoken, or do I but dream? Sir, sir, these things are true, and they are spoken. <laughs>
Jerry that can hero. Hero itself can blot out hero's virtue. What man was he talking to yesterday? I am window who took 12 and 1. Now, if you are a maid, answer to this. I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Why then are you no maiden? Leonardo, I'm sorry you must go. Upon my honor, myself, my brother, and this grieving count did see her, your honor, at that hour last night, talk with a ruffian at a chamber window, who had indeed, most like a liberal villain, confessed the wild encounters they've had a thousand times in secret. Fine, fine, they're not to be named, my lord, not to be spoken of. There's not chastity enough in language to utter them without offense. But, oi, oi, that pretty lady, <laughs> I am sorry for how much miss the offer made. Oh, hero, what a hero thou hast been. If half thy outward graces have been placed upon the thoughts and counsels of thine heart, but fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, thou pure and piety and pious purity. For thee, I'll lock up the gates of love, and on my island shall conjecture hang. To turn all thoughts of beauty into harmony, never shall it be more gracious. Have no man's dagger here a point for me! Oh, let us go. Oh, that was a hero! What a poor thing you have! How about the lady? Oh, fate, take not away thy heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be asked for. How now, brother Nero? How comfort lady? Dost thou look up? Yea, wherefore should she not? Wherefore? Why? Doth not every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Could she here deny the story that is printed in her blood? Do not live, hero, do not open thine eyes, for did I think thou wouldst not quickly die? Thought I thy spirits were stronger than thy shames? Myself would, on the rearward of reproaches, strike at thy life. Grieved I, I had but one, chide I for that at frugal nature's frame. Oh, one too much by thee, why had I one? Why? Had I not, with charitable hand, took up a beggar's issues at my gates, who smirched thus and mired with infamy, I might have said, no part of it is mine. This shame derives itself from unknown loins. But mine, and mine I love, and mine I praised, and mine that I was proud of, mine so much that I myself was to myself not mine. Why valuing of her? Why she, oh she, is fallen into a pit of ink that the wide sea hath dropped too few to wash her clean again, and salt too little with a seasoned gift to her foul tainted flatterer! Sir, be patient. For my part, I am so tired and wonder I know not what to say. Oh, on my soul, my cousin is belied! Lady, were you her bedfellow last night? No, truly not, although until last night I have this twelve month been her bedfellow. Confirmed, confirmed. That was stronger made up than was barred with ribs of iron. Would the two princes lie? And Claudio lie, who speaking of her foulness washed it with tears? Hence from her, let her die! Hear me a little, for I've only sat in bed for so long. Given way unto this course of fortune, by noting of the lady, I have marked on her a thousand blushing apparitions to start into her face. A thousand innocent shades and angel whiteness to beat away those blushes. And in her eye there hath appeared a fire to burn these errors the princess hold against her maiden truth. Call me a fool. Trust not my readings nor my observations, with which experimental steel doth warn the tenor of my book. Trust not my age, reference, calling, nor divinity. If this sweet lady lie not guiltless here under some biting error. Good mother, thou conceivest that the only grace that she hath left is that she will not add to her damnation a sin of perjury. She denies it not. Why seekest thou to cover that what appears in proper nakedness? Lady, what man is he you were accused of? They know but to accuse me. I know none. If I know more of any man alive than that which made modesty doth warrant, let all my sins lack mercy. O oh, my father, prove you that any man with me converse in hours unmeet, or that I yesterday maintained the change of words with any creature. Refuse me, hate me, torture me to death. There is some strange misprison in these princes. 
Two of them have the very bent of honor. And if their wisdom to be misled in this, the practice of it lives in John the Bastard, whose spirits toil in frames of villainy. I know not if they speak but the truth of her. These hands shall tear her. But if they wrong her honor, the proudest of them will well hear of it. Pause a while and let my counsel sway you in this case. Your daughter here, the princess left her dead. Let her while be secretly kept in and publish it that she is dead indeed. Maintain a mourning ostentation and upon your family's old monuments and mournful epitaphs and do all rights that appertain unto a burial. What will become of this? What will this do? Mary, if well carried, this shall on her behalf change slander to remorse. That is some good. But not from that dream I on this strange course, but on this travail of her greater birth. She, dying, as so it is to be maintained, upon the instant she was accused, shall be lamented, pitied, and excused out of every hearing. For so it falls out that what we have we prize not to the worth whilst we have it. But being lacked and lost, then we lack the value. Then we find a virtue that possession did not show us while it was ours. So will there applaud you. When he shall hear she died upon his words, the idea of her life shall sweetly creep into her study of imagination. Every lovely organ of her life shall come apparel to more precious habit, more moving, delicate, and full of life than when she lived indeed. And then we shall mourn, if ever love had interest in his heart, and wish he had not so accused her, though he thought his accusation true. Let this be so, and doubt not the success will fashion you in better shape than I can lay down my name. And if all aims to this be level false, the supposition of the lady's death shall quench the wonder of her infamy. And if it sort not well, you may conceal her, as best befits her wounded reputation, in some reclusive or religious lifestyle, out of all eyes, minds, tongues, and injuries. Signor Leonardo, let the good mother advise you. Though you know my inwardness and love is very much unto the Prince and Claudio, know that I will deal in this as secretly and justly as your soul should with your body. Being that I flow in grief, the smallest twine may leave me. Tis well consented. For a strange sore, strangely they strand it here. Come, me. Die to live. This wedding day is but perhaps prolonged. Have patience and enjoy. Beatrice! In faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. <laughs> you dare? 
friends with me than fight with my enemy? Is Claudio my enemy? Is he not a proof in the height of women that have slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man, what? Bearer in hand until they come to take hands, and then with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor? Oh, God, that I were a man. I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Hear me, Beatrice. Come with a man out at a window, a brother saying. Nay, but Beatrice. Sweet hero, she is wrong. She is slandered. She is undone. Beatrice. Princes and counties, surely a princely testimony, a goodly count. Count Compact, a sweet gallant, surely. Oh, that I were a man for his sake, or that I had any friend would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into curtsies, valor into compliment, and men are only turned into tongue. And Trin ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Terry, good Beatrice, by this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul the Count Claudio hath wronged hero? Yea, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge him. Kiss your hand, and so I leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go, comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. And so farewell. <coughs> is 
Paul. <laughs> and that is more masters than you can deny. <clears throat> Prince John was this morning secretly stolen away. Hero who was in this manner accused and in this very manner refused, upon the grave of this, suddenly died. <coughs> Don Berry, let these men be bound and brought to Leonardo's. I will go before him and show them their examination. Come, let them be opinioned. <laughs> Let him kill one first. 
which I had rather seal with my death than repeat over to my shame. The lady is dead upon mine and my master's false accusations. And briefly, I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. Guns love this speech like iron through your blood and drunk poison while he uttered it. But did my brother set thee on to this? Yea, and pay me richly for the practice of it. He is composed and trained of treachery, and fled he is upon this villainy. O oh, hero, now thy image doth appear in the rare semblance at which I loved it first. Come, bring away the plaintiffs. By this time our sex do not perform to me on Leonardo of the matter. And masters, do not forget to specify when time and place shall serve that I am an ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the villain? Let me see his eyes, so that when I know another like him, I may know to avoid him. Is this he? If you would know your wronger, look on me. Art thou the slave that with thy breath hast killed my innocent child? Yea, even I alone. Nay, thou belies thyself. Here stand a pair of honorable men. A third is fled that had a hand in the action. Gentlemen, both I thank you for my daughter's death, recorded with your high and worthy deeds. Twas bravely done if you bethink you of it. I know not how to pray your patience, yet I must speak. Choose your revenge yourself, and post to me what penance your vengeance can lay upon my sin, yet sin I not but in mistaking. By my soul, nor I, and yet to satisfy this good old man, I'll bend under any heavy weight that he will join me to. Gentlemen both, cannot bid you, my daughter, live. That were impossible. But I pray you, possess the people here in Messina, how innocent she died. And if your love can labor in a sad invention, go to her tomb and hang a mournful epitaph and sing to her bones. Sing it tonight. Then, tomorrow morning, since you could not yet be my son-in-law, be my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, almost the exact copy of the hero that is dead. <laughs> Give her the right you should have given her cousin, and so dies my revenge. Oh, noble sir, your overkindness doth win tears for me. I embrace your offer and dispose for henceforth the poor Claudia. Now, we will look to this naughty fellow and see how his acquaintance grew with Margaret, whom I believe had a hand in all of this. No, by my soul she did not, nor knew not what she did when she spoke to me, but always hath been just and virtuous in anything that I do know by her. Uh, moreover, sir, which indeed is not under white and black, this plaintiff here, the offender, did call me ass. I beseech you, let me remember in his punishment. Pray examine him upon that point. I will thank thee for thy care and honest pains. Your worship speaks like a most thankful and reverent youth, and I praise God for you. Uh, for thy pains. God save the foundation. <laughs> I thank thee for thy service and discharge thee of thy prison. I leave an errant name with your worship, which I beseech your worship to correct yourself for the example of others. God keep your worship. I wish your worship well. So I'll restore you to health. I humbly give you leave to depart. And a merry meeting may be wished. God Beatrice. Will you then write me a sonnet in praise of my beauty? 
In so high a style, Margaret, that no man living shall come over it. <laughs> no man come over me? Why, shall I always keep below stairs? Ah, thy wit is like a greyhound's mouth. It catches. <laughs> and yours is blood as the fencer's foils, which hit, but hurt not. <laughs> well, I will call the interest to you, who I think hath less. And therefore will come. <laughs> The God of <laughs> that sits up <laughs> and knows me and knows me. How pitiful I desire! <laughs> <sighs> Has there ever been anyone so turned over and over as my poor self in love? I cannot show it in rhyme. I <laughs> I can find no rhyme for lady but baby, an innocent rhyme. For scorn, horn, a hard rhyme. For school, fool, a babbling rhyme. Very ominous endings. <laughs> no, I was not born under a rhyming planet, nor can I woo in festival terms. Sweet Lady Beatrice, wouldst thou come when I called thee? Yea, and depart when you bid me. Oh, but stay till then. That is spoken fare you well now. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, ere I go, let me go with that I came, which is what hath passed between you and Claudia. Only foul words. Thereupon I will kiss thee. Foul words is but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is noisome. Therefore I will depart on this. Thou hast right the word out of his right sense, so forcible is thy wit. But I must tell thee plainly, Claudia undergoes my challenge, and I must shortly hear from him, or I will subscribe him a coward. Now tell me. For which of my bad parts did thou first fall in love with me? For them all together, which maintain so politic a state of evil that they would not permit any good part to intermingle with them. But for which of my good parts did you first? Suffer love for me. Suffer love, a good epithet, for I do love thee against my will. <laughs> like your heart, I think, the last poor heart. If you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours, for I will never love that which my friend hates. Thou and I are too wise to woo peaceably. It appears not in this confession. There is not one wise man among twenty who would praise himself. Well, so much for praising myself, who, I will myself bear witness, is praiseworthy. <laughs> now tell me, how doth your cousin? Very ill. And how do you? Very ill, too. Serve God, love me, <laughs> and men. Thereupon I leave you, here comes one haste. Madam, you must come to your uncle. It is proved my lady hero hath been falsely accused. The prince and Claudio mightily abused, and Don John is the author of all who is fled and gone. Will you come presently? Will you hear this news, senor? I will live in thy heart, die in thy lap, and be buried in thine eyes. And moreover, I will go with these lamps. <laughs> Round 
unto thy bones, good night. Yearly will I do this right. Look, the gentle day before the wheels of Phoebus, round about dapples the drowsy east with spots of gray. Let us hence and put on all the weeds, and then to Leonardo's we will go. And Hymen now with luckier as she speeds, for whom we rendered up this well. But 
thy faith I take thee for pity. <laughs> I would not deny you when by this good day I yield upon great persuasion, and partly to save your life, for I was told you were in consumption. Peace. I will stop your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> How dost thou, Benedict, the married man? Oh, I'll tell thee what, Prince. A college of witchcrackers cannot flout me out of my humor. In brief, since I do purpose to marry, I will think nothing to any purpose that the world can say against it, and therefore never flout at me. For man is a giddy thing. And this is my conclusion. Claudio, for thy part, I can think to have beaten thee. But since thou art like to be my kinsman, live unbruised and love my cousin. I well hope thou wouldst have denied thee, Interest, that I could have cudgeled thee out of thy single life, making thee a double dealer, which thou wilt be, and my cousin do not look exceeding narrowly to thee. Come, come, we are friends. Let's have a dance ere we are married, that we may like our own hearts and our wives' views. We'll have the dancing afterward. First of my word, therefore music play. Prince, thou art sad. Get thee a wife. Get thee a wife! <laughs> Think not on him till tomorrow. I'll devise thee brave punishments for him. Till then, advance! 